a lot of Q&A. I mean, I think a lot of, you know, I was pretty flattered by how many people knew who I was. So you want to go wine, you want to go tech, entrepreneurship, investing, social 101, don't be embarrassed. I looked at a lot of people that were tweeting about today's events. There's not that many experts. So, just kidding. Um, just tell me your name. Yes, ma'am. My name is Summer Bach. And hey, Summer. I run an online business. I'm going to repeat this, right? Or the acoustics are pretty good here. Yeah, go a little louder, Summer, if you don't mind. So I run an online business where I teach people how to rebuild their guts using probiotics and fermented foods. And this year, it's awesome. Like, I'm here for seven weeks. I live in Portland, and I'm able to go wherever. And I use social media a lot, and that's where I do get a lot of business from. Um, I'm, the place that I'm really struggling and the place I'm really curious is with Vine and Instagram. Yep. Like, I cannot figure out how to market my company on Instagram. So who's your target audience? My target audience is primarily people with digestive issues, but also wellness practitioners who are trying to figure out how to help people. Got it. So it's almost like a B two B. You're like you're not going I directly. Both. To, yeah. I both, but most my a lot of my work, um, I just a lot of wellness practitioners are attracted to my work because it's pretty high level. Yep. So are you're not mainly targeting twelve to twenty three year olds. I'm not. Good. So fuck mine. <laughs> right. I mean that's the truth. So far, right. You don't need to play there. Right? Like the truth is, not everybody needs to be everywhere. Like if your audience is not there, now look, here's where people get caught. People will be there. Things get older. Look at Instagram. The fastest growth in Instagram is 40 year old female. As a matter of fact, the new stat I just saw the fastest growing sector of individuals that are taking selfies are 40 to 50 year old women. Your mom is selfie. <laughs> Cougar selfies everywhere. Um, so, so, couple things. Instagram, you need to be at. And so, and look, you need to figure it out. Look, I'm not, here's what's really interesting. I'm not good at Instagram. For, like, I understand what it takes to be good at it. I'm not naturally good at it. Because I didn't grow up taking pictures. I don't think that way. Like, I basically take angry selfies of myself at the airport and pictures of my sneaker. I suck. Right? It's not what I story tell it. Twitter, I'm good. Facebook, I'm good. There's places where you can be good and bad. But let me tell you this. There's a couple things. First and foremost, you need to understand hashtag culture. The most important thing for you to get discovered, especially now that Instagram discovery has gone personal, you have to get good at hashtag culture. You need to go back home and search all the hashtag data around the hashtags you need to be using on every photo. I guarantee if I looked at all the photos you put out, you aren't putting enough hashtags in there that are relevant to reach your audience. Because once people get down the hashtag rabbit hole, that's how they can discover you. That's number one. Number two, you need to figure out how to put out good Instagram photos. I don't know what that is. It might be infographics. It might be, I don't know what it is for your business. I don't. But you need to be testing and you need to be also do homework. Like, you need to allocate 10 to 40 hours and search successful Instagram accounts and do data and search, right? And so like, you know, it takes work. And look, Instagram is still tough. It's still very personal. It's not looking for businesses to be on there as much. Um, people aren't following as many things as they did before because they learned that lesson. So the, the bar is raised. You gotta be better. The other thing, the, I'll be right there. The other thing that you really, 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 really need to focus on is Pinterest. I will tell you right now, with just on top line understanding of what you just said, you need to go all in on Pinterest. Pinterest is the holy grail for you. And it's a lot of work. And you may have to invest in a designer. Uh, I don't know the size of your business, but like you've gotta, you've gotta really, read, if you haven't read the chapter, read the chapter on Pinterest, but you need to do way more homework than that. The good news is Pinterest just launched their paid product. So they have a new ad product coming out that I think is gonna do very, very, very well. I, I would highly recommend you Google the crap out of Pinterest business stuff over the next month or two and really learn it. Great. Thanks so much. You got it. I'm going to go to that gentleman first and then you, my friend. What's up? My name is Eric. Eric, how are you, man? Good. How are you doing, Gary? Love your beard, bro. Thanks, bro. <laughs> so Thanks. Question. How do you go about sniffing out like the new apps and new promotional products that are coming out? Like, How do you know like this is the shit that I want to promote my stuff? Yeah. It's a great question. You know, I always tell people, I'm not Nostradamus, right? Like I'm, not, like, I'm not this great predictor. I'm just reacting to reality, meaning way too many people are, like, so obsessed with predicting the next thing. I'm not. I started paying attention to Vine three weeks after it launched because it was in the top 50 and top 20 of the iTunes 
free app store. Like, if people were using it, it was worth my time. I mean, people tell me, like, six months ago, somebody's like, I don't know about this Instagram, it might be a fad. I'm like, asshole, 200 million people use it. <laughs> like, what fad, right? Like, are you out of your mind? So, like, here's what I do. A couple of basic things. I read TechCrunch and Tech Meme every morning to just see if anything launched from a good entrepreneur that's won before. I, every morning, the first thing I do before I brush my teeth, I look at the iTunes and Android top 100, top 200 apps. Like, I knew about Yik Yak way before anybody else because there it was. And like, I'm like, okay, what's this? And like, I'm not scared of like jumping in and figuring it out. It's what I do. I get my hands dirty, right? Like, I play in the clouds and in the dirt. I'm thinking up here, and then the second I see something that has a chance of being relevant, I put in the work. And whether Yik Yak disappears or stays forever, I'm not worried because right now it's at enough scale that it merits my attention if I want to be a leader in understanding what it's about. And so it's not that hard. And there's nothing, now I have one other slight advantage at this point in my career that I used to not have, which is I have a $25 million seed fund that I do investing through and I've seen companies before they even launch. But to be very honest, the number of things I've seen through that vehicle in comparison to the thing everybody in here can do, which is open the top 200 apps on iTunes, has been far less. I mean, you know, I remember talking to like all the digital leaders about one Nalo, you know, like 18 months ago, and they're like, what? They're like, nobody knew what it was because it was mainly targeting 14 to 19 year old girls at the time. It wasn't in TechCrunch or Mashable. I don't care about the press, I care about the user behavior. And so I'm just looking for places where I can see that behavior, right? And nothing's better right now than the app store's top lists of free apps. You just watch what people are looking. I'm looking at a company right now, like We Heart It, right? Like I'm looking at this stuff. And so, you know, you look at it and you look at it and you try to decide if you believe in it. My man. My man. Hey, so I know a lot of us learn from our setbacks. Yeah. Our yeah. I hate this question. I know, sorry. No, no, I hate it because of two things. One, I'm such an obnoxious optimist that like, the second like something bad happens, I forget about it and make pretend it never happened, right? I'm like good like that. It keeps me pretty happy. My biggest mistake was in 2009 when I was transitioning off of Wine Library TV, winelibrary.com. And my brother and I started VaynerMedia, and I was writing Crush It, which was on its way to becoming a big time book. And I also start, bought Corked, which was a wine social network. And I started Obsessed TV, which was like an interview show that was similar to Wine Library TV. And I got big eyes. I tried to bite off more than I could chew. And sometimes when you're running five businesses, you're running none. And uh, I learned my lesson. And I learned that if I was gonna do it in the future, I couldn't be the operator in the business, my partner had to be, and that I needed more money, that I would, like, I can scrap it by, but not everybody has that ability, and so my biggest mistake, hands down, was in the summer of 2009, and my first daughter was born, and like, I just decided to go insane and try to do everything at one time, and it was too much, and things failed for the first time for me, mainly because I wasn't driving them. And it's been great, because now I've got the new fund, and we're incubating companies, and I have a much better chance of being successful with some of the stuff I'm building right now, mainly because of what I learned back in 09. Thanks, man. Yes, ma'am, all the way in the back. Um, I'm Caroline, and... Um, how are I'm, you? I'm good, how are you? Good, thanks for being here. Um, thanks for coming. Um, so I look, I'm very interested in the wine world, and Great. I personally think it's one of the most romantic markets out there. It's the best for stories, and it's the best. It's probably the longest journey out there. So where do you see wine going? In the US? All over, France. I can speak to the US, okay. that's what I'm asking, I apologize. I just don't know the markets outside the US as well. Wine's in a really good spot in America. Um, you know, we're past the douchey phase. You know, 1970s, 80s, 90s, if you drank wine, you were douche, right? And so um, you were fancy, you were snobby, Right? And then everybody else drank white Zinfandel and box wine. Right? There was just no middle class. And the middle class started emerging in the mid 90s. Um, and then the wine spectator and Robert Parker became the engines that drove all of wine. And then look, I'm very proud. I think one of the most proud things I'll have in my legacy is there will be that Wikipedia entry of when I started with Wine Library TV because when I started with Wine Library TV, 
became the preview to what was about to happen in the world wine world, which is we live in an incredible democracy of wine now. For 15 years, the wine spectator Robert Parker basically dictated what everybody was drinking in America that cared enough to care about wine. And now we're in a place where people are trying new things. You know, America, as of 10 years ago, mainly drank six or seven or eight different varietals. And, and then a movie came out and we drank Pinot Noir and that made it nine, right? <laughs> so, like, it, you know, people weren't drinking different things. I think that it's, it blows me up. Like, I grew up in the wine business and I tried to get my 21, 22, 23, 24 year old friends in the mid 90s, late 90s to get into wine and they had no interest. It blows my mind, the interest in wine for the 21 to 30 year old sector. We're drinking different wines from different parts of the world. The quality of wine, is greater than ever because of technology about knowing weather conditions. So, I mean, you used to be able to buy a really crappy bottle of wine for 10 bucks. No joke, it's getting hard. You may not like it, but to get a bad bottle of wine for 10 bucks is getting hard. You know, with Argentinian Malbec and New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and like all these things. So, um, I'm very bullish on it. I actually miss the wine business quite a bit lately. This is like a new thing for me in the last, I, I mean, I did it every day of my life from 15 to 35, so I was burned out when I decided to start doing the agency with my brother and investing in other things. But I find myself gravitating back to it. I've got some things in my mind of getting a little bit deeper back into it. And so I think it's a great time for the wine world. Well, do you think, sorry. Well, oh, please, I can tell you think, that you weren't done. Well, because it, <laughs> because it um, is such a shared experience and yes. people open a bottle and want to feel the story. Do you see that changing a lot and be more a personal experience? I do think some people drink wine by themselves. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's what's great about wine. Wine is, it's why it was such a good business for me. I'm a storyteller. And boy, does wine allow you to storytell. I mean, I used to, I mean, I was in the, I mean, I learned my craft in the store. I learned that everybody in here would much rather me tell you about the golden retriever that ran around the vineyards and ate the grapes than how many percentage of sugar was in the wine. Got it? And so that's why my show did so well, right? Like I was able to tell stories about the wines I was drinking. And so, no, I think that never goes away. I think wine is, I, I like to think that wine was the original social network. You know, it brings people together. It is a beverage that is drank with more than one person more than beer and vodka by, and liquor um, by percentage. Um, and so, no, I think it's got a very bright future of being a connector. And I do think, you know, look, Tennessee has this state, like you guys are at the disservice of Tennessee laws around wine shipping. So this state is behind a lot of other places, even smaller states, less progressive states, because of the laws, right? Because great wine companies like my company wasn't or able to ship here for a long time, or can, or things of that nature. But, you, you know, I don't know how much time people spend outside, but it's incredible whether rural, southwest, northwest, just wine culture is exploding. Cool. Yes, sir. Good to see you. What's your name? David. David. I'll repeat it for you guys over there. I'm worried that you guys aren't hearing it. I'm in. Yes, thank you so much. Let's clap it up for the man that brought me a present. You got it. Thank you so much. Oh man, I need smart pants. I have a feeling I'm eating a goddamn thing. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Sure. It's like a legendary uh, crisp import. Yeah. 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 No, it's great. I love the I love the lift guys. By the way, the market's so big that they're both gonna win. I really believe in that. Mm. 
How many employees are you? Right now we're only eight. Eight. So, so we're good for you. And you're worried about the dynamic changes. I have some insights. I really do. This is this is really my real house. This will ultimately be the. Somebody asked me earlier today when I'm writing my HR book. Um, I'm not ready to, but this will be the best thing I'll ever put out into the world. I know that for a fact. You're looking at an HR-driven CEO. I, VaynerMedia has gone from 20 to 400 employees in the last 30 months, and I'm the only person in the HR department. So you've stepped in shit. I got a lot of insights. <laughs> um, here's the number one thing I'll tell you. Every company lies about how much they care about the customer and how much they care about their employees. It's really easy to say it. I care about customers and my employees. That was easy, right? I think of it like parenting. All these parents come to me like, oh, Gary, like all this technology is so bad. I don't want my kid on the iPad for seven hours a day. I'm like, well, then don't let them, right? So I would give you one huge piece of advice. If you truly care about the question you just asked me, put in the work, right? For example, back to the earlier joke, I desperately want a six pack, right? I don't have one. I know how to do it. I know the exercises. I know the food I need to eat. I can Google everything I need in 20 seconds to figure out how to get a six pack, but I don't have one because I didn't put in the work. I am busy as shit. I blew away my friends that were with me today because they saw that I got a thousand text messages in the six hours that I was hanging out with them. That's busy, right? And yet I spend between three and six hours a day on HR. Now, you and I are in the same business. You know what I can do in those three or six hours from getting incremental scope, going and getting new business, right? I really care about culture. I really care about my, my employees. And I, look, I start with my employees. I tell my, my, uh, I tell my customers, the Pepsis and the G's and the Doves, and I tell them I care about my employees first, I care about your customers on the platforms that we create for second, and then I care about you. And, I, and the best part is, we execute against that. And so, the reason I do it, by the way, I'm not Mother Teresa. I do it because I know I'm not gonna run VaynerMedia forever. And if I wanted to do what Wine Library did, I need to build a family. And you know how you build a family? You listen. And so the reason it takes me three to four hours a day, your biggest problem, is you need, and look, you could have this problem at eight. You don't need 15. You need to know what all of those eight people want in their lives. I spent all my life, basically it feels like, trying to build trust with my employees so that they'll tell me the truth of what they actually want to happen. And I'm agenda agnostic. I don't care what you want. I don't care if you want to make $500,000 a year and not work that much, cool. You know, I don't care if you want to steal seven of my employees and then start your own agency, cool, and I'm not joking. I don't care if you want to be the CEO, I don't care if you want to learn everything you can from me and then go into a startup and say you worked with me, I do not care. Just tell me so that we, we can map it together. So if you want to address it, I recommend you do a whole lot of listening. You're welcome, man. Human eye. <laughs> Got it. Yes, sir. <laughs> By the way, I did get your text. But when you get a thousand a day, yeah. I just wanted you to know I got it. I appreciate it. I like how you wrote it. Is this still Gary V's cell phone number? <laughs> yes, sir. Don't give it out. I'll kill you. <laughs> but if somebody offers you money, take it. Capitalism, baby. How are you, man? Good to see you. Good, good. Yeah, you. thanks, brother.
becoming something that's important for them to reach out to some of the people who are here, like the designers and the developers, when they're trying to implement a social media something. You know, oftentimes the smaller business owners tend to do it, try and just do it themselves without um, thinking of the necessary time involved. Yep. Let me, I want to make sure I get this straight. Are, are you asking when, when, do, how do you sell to a small business that doesn't value hiring somebody that has more expertise? Or the way you structured the question, the first part, when do you reach out to other people that can execute maybe your strategy? I just want to make sure I I'm understanding. Kind of, I think that's kind of both sides. That's kind of like the question as a business and then the question from somebody. Are you saying as a strategist around social, both of your problems are, how do I get customers to believe in the value prop? And then number two, if I actually get them, how do I find people to actually execute it? Yes. Cool. So, the number one rule I have about sales is not to convince anybody about anything. I have no interest in selling to you if you don't believe. So, a lot of people try to go and say, hey, Tony's Pizza in downtown, you need social media. You need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. And Tony's like, get the hell out of here. That's about where it ends for me. I have no interest in ever convincing anybody that what I'm doing is right. Because I'd much rather spend all my time on offense and none of it on defense. So I'd rather you turn around a thousand stones than trying to dig deeper under the 50 stones that you turned over. Got it? That's number one. Number two, you know, I would be, I think what you should do is be knowledgeable about who can do the things in your town before you ever go to sell. Like you should have a fairly good understanding of the freelance slash capabilities and Rolodex because if you walk in and you start up turning over a thousand stones like I told you to and you get four yeses, it's time to work. So I would highly recommend having that in your pocket before you start. <laughs> hey Randy. Well, because this matters too. Yeah. This is not an all or nothing game, okay. right? But if you were asking me, can I reach, I can tell you right now, it's about width and depth, right? I can reach, in the, all the hours that I've been here to get here and all that, I could have reached a hell of a lot more people than I'm reaching right now. But the human spirit is real, right? Like, there's a, look, Strat and I have had a relationship for six, seven years, most of it digital, right? I'm, I've had, I mean, there's, how many people here have known about me for more than three years but have never seen me in person before? Raise your hand. So here's what I think a lot about. I did all those things technology-wise as a gateway drug to this moment, right? And now I get to make it even deeper than it was before. And so, because they both work. Got it? That's how I think about it. You got me. Hi, I'm Lauren. Hi, um, Lauren. We talked a lot about business and everything. Yep. But do you see any trends in particularly K-12 education? I teach middle school. Yep. Um, I have an app to text my oh, students man. and their parents. <laughs> but, I'm sorry, um, keep going. Uh, sixth grade. Um, but do you see any trends <laughs> for me to use with my students to connect with parents? Anything yeah. like that? So allow me to like stand on a soapbox for two minutes and then sure. I'll answer your question. I am flat, yes, here's the biggest trend I see. That the way we educate our children right now is so broken, it makes me actually want to slip off of this and hit my head. And uh, my sister, my sister, I, I, and I believe that you, I'm, most teachers that I know that are paying attention do. Because actually, here's the problem. We are asking by formation, I'm not, I don't blame you, you've got to follow, the, like I get how it works, this is not, it's not capitalism in the school systems. Um, we are teaching our children to memorize shit and then regurgitate it in a world where everything they, who's the ninth president in the United States history? This old fucker. <laughs> there it is. 
Like, it is ludicrous what we're doing right now. We need to completely reverse it, which is they can memorize the shit at home or don't memorize it at all because it's never been less valuable to be information smart than it is now because anything you want to know is right here. Remember, remember some of the older ones? Remember when it was actually interesting to be information smart? That ship has sailed. I don't care if you know something, I can tell you the same thing in four minutes, four seconds, eight seconds, it's right here. So, you know, I'm struggling with it in a big way, right? Like, it's really broken, it, it, it's, it's not the reality of the world we live in, it's, you know, the whole game, I, I think that all schools should go to the business format, and like, like, you know why teachers are underpaid? Because, like, the structure. Go create a school where it's complete capitalism and every school is capitalistic, and then the best teachers are gonna get paid plenty. Sure. You know, like, I mean, it's just, it's so broken, it's ridiculous. Um, most kids are learning more on their own than they are in the classroom because they have more information mm -hmm. at their fingertip everywhere else. Back to your question. You know, look, I don't know the rules. Every principal, every superintendent runs it differently. Like, I love the notion of you texting with every mom in the class. You know, communication's good, kids can't hide through the structure. I hid for 12 years through the structure. I used to rip my report card up the second it got to my mailbox and flush it down the toilet to buy three to six more days of freedom before my mom got wind and punished me for three weeks. That was the game. In today's world, you could email me that. You could send it, like, like there's a lot of things to do, but the truth is, what I would implore, and what I implore my sister, who's a teacher, to do, and some of my other friends, my most practical advice to a sixth grade teacher is to try to build the self-esteem of the students in your class. That would be, that is the thing I spend my entire life thinking about, which is the only tool against all the pressures that our kids face is self-esteem. That is the weapon. And so, I only had one teacher ever that I saw now rewinding my brain and realizing what she was doing that went person by person in her class and accelerated and, and, and celebrated their unique individual strengths, whether it's sports, school, personality, humor, kindness, prettiness, whatever it was, she built self-esteem and that's why I remember her. Cool. Yes, sir. Bald guy. Yes, sir. Bald guy. Matt. Good looking bald guy. Yeah. Matt. No, his beard is way better. Than yours. <laughs> yes. 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 You know, it's kind of like the six pack story. Like, what can you guys do to be more of a startup city? be more of a startup city, right? Like the truth is, what can you do? Some of it's serendipitous. There's some gal in the crowd right now who's got an idea, who's gonna execute it, and it's gonna become a $3 billion company, and then everybody's gonna say, well, this is where the talent is, right? I mean, it's, you know, there's all these lucky factors. I think the best thing you can do is, you know, the government, and which has a lot of leverage in, in this question, and the private sector that's been successful come together and try to create some sort of infrastructure that allows for sex appeal to attract talent to come here. Look, something, here's the biggest thing that struck me. This is a compliment, take it. I don't like to give them. Um, this is a nicer, it's not nice like you're nice. Most people are nice outside of New York. Um, uh, it's prettier here. And I think you guys have a raw, actual advantage over other places that I've been to that look like you, where I genuinely believe that if somebody comes here and looked at the other nine, look, downtown Vegas is amazing and Tony Shea's a superstar, but it's nowhere as nice to live there as it is here, right? You guys have something here, like, I was telling the guys and gals I was hanging out with, like, do you guys have like a summery season here? It feels like, it feels like vacation here because of the water, and like, I actually think you guys have a uniquely like, you were gifted. Mother Nature gifted you, and I would actually triple down on that. And then, and then, look, the rest is raw. Look, I'm at, look, VaynerMedia is gonna open a middle America office. And I'm contemplating this city, and I can tell you right now. But don't clap, I'm not a nice guy. It's gonna come down to the deal, right? 
like, like, uh, like uh, you know, I'm getting ludicrous offers from Columbus, Ohio, and Omaha, Nebraska. Crazy subsidies, buildings, like crazy stuff. And I saw that. I saw that. I think, I think, you know, you can only push it so far. You, you know, there's only so much the government can do, and they can do a lot. And then it's going to come down to the people. How much you guys champion for it? You know, um, I think, I think. Please. Yes. You know, you're working south, cost of living. Um, yep. You know, you're already holding on something that's very important to me. Uh, Which is? Pretty, uh, attractive area is. I think that's a big one, because not everybody has that. But when you're working with millennials, or yep. types of people that are starting things, is there anything geographically? I think it's the answer I, I gave over there, which is there's no one size fits all. You guys have to listen. Create a listening center. Where when people come here, listen. Like, there's a lot of millennials that are not driven as much by finance. They will enjoy the work-life balance. They will enjoy the romance of like, and if you drive 40 minutes here, you're hunting, and here's the water, and like, the answer is listen. Like, I'm a great salesman because I listen. I just listen, and then I know what you want, and then I give it to you. Got it? So I think the answer comes in a lot of forms, and you've got a lot of resources, and you do have some inherent advantages. I think one thing you desperately need is a direct flight from New York. <laughs> if you guys can figure that out, I'd be far more interested. <laughs> All the way to back. Hey, hey Sheldon. Um, can you talk about Vayner RSE and yeah, what you're doing through that? What kinds of things are you looking for? Yeah. So Vayner RSC is a fund I started um, a couple months ago with a very interesting situation. I only have one LP. One person gave me the $25 million. That's a very weird person if you really know me. He's the owner of the Miami Dolphins, a team I hate with all my heart. Um, but he's an amazing man, Steve Ross. Um, and uh, he, uh, he, uh, he wanted to do this with me, and I said under one condition. And he's like, what? And I'm like, well, yeah, I wish. He was actually the runner-up to buying the Jets, which is devastating for the whole story. Um, he, uh, I told him that I can't change my behavior. But the reason you want to give me money is because I've done really well. You want the guy that invested in Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr in 2007. You want the guy that after Birchbox got 80 no's said yes, and it was invested at 3 million, that's 500 million. Like, you want the guy that invested in Uber. The only way I know how to do that is to make a lot of weird investments based on a lot of my gut feel, a lot of things that most people won't see. So what I'm looking for is the feeling. And, right, and that's like a shitty answer, right? Because it's not a very clear answer. It's a one-person subjective answer. But it's the answer. Do I believe in the entrepreneur? Do I think that she or he can navigate when it gets shitty? Because it always gets shitty when you're a startup. Is the idea something I believe in? Do I understand? How can I help? That's a big one for me. Like, what, what inherent advantages do I have that I can apply to this build, business to then speed up the process to victory? Who do I know that can help? Um, that's what I look for. Yes, dear. Hi, so um, my name is Mary. Hey, Mary. I was recently put in charge of creating a social media presence for a high school kind of model UN organization here in Chattanooga. And I was wondering. What What's the KPI? What's the objective? What do they want you to accomplish with that? What do they want you to, let's say that you knew exactly how to get every person in the broader southeastern area on board to pay attention to you. What is the next thing that they're going to ask all those people to do? Come to Chattanooga, be willing to come to Chattanooga and to participate in our conference and our educational experience. We're looking not just at the students, but at the actual educational facilities. So we're trying to market the two completely different groups. Yep. And you want to basically tell stories that make students want to go there? That too, yeah, absolutely. What else? When you said that too for the students, is there something else you want from the students? Um, I mean, we want the students to kind of, we just, we just need the students to kind of understand what our program can do for them. Um, while, um, 
I get that. But like at its raw state, you want people to sign up. And you want other people, other teachers to come in or facility people or things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, we don't just want students to be like, oh yeah, we like this, we want you to come here, we want you to help us build this kind of organization. So what you want the students to help you build it by actually joining it and going through the curriculum and like, yeah. doing it, and then just having the leverage of having a lot of students to continue to execute what you want, in a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I know I can make these things seem a little raw. Oh, uh, um, okay, well the good news is, that's why social media is good, right? Like you can do Instagram and Snapchat and Vine for the kids, and you can do Facebook targeting and Twitter for the non-kids. I mean, literally the book that you were given is my entire thought process on this subject matter. You should read it twice. <laughs> Just kidding, kidding. Um, no, but I, I think here, look, let me give you this and I'll leave you with this, and I think this is the best point and the most important point, and this is where everybody breaks down. The reason I call this book Jab, 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 Right Hook is because it stands for give, 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 and then ask. The mistake that a lot of organizations that look like you always do is every tweet, every Vine, every Facebook post is ask, 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 ask. Or even worse, gimme, 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 gimme. Mm -hmm. So I would tell you that you need a very good strategy of creating relevant content that provides them value, that, and especially for the kids, that has nothing maybe to do with the school. Maybe just the shit they care about. If a school actually knows who the music acts or the TV shows are that they care about, you've got a relevancy that might actually work to convert them. Thank you. So you need to become a media company is what I'm really saying. <laughs> Let me just go back over here. Yeah, my man. Uh, my name is Noah. Noah. Uh, inside sales for a certain company. Awesome. And, uh, a lot of the guys here are too. I know some you like those guys? Do you like those dudes? That's my boss, I better say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I know a lot of people are not picking up their phones anymore. They're getting yep. flooded with emails. Yep. Do you foresee any other avenues uh, aside from you know, social media reaching out and, and blogging? From a cold call standpoint? Yeah, as far as reaching your people. I think the single best thing's about to come for you, which is LinkedIn is about to launch a new product that is gonna really work for you. Because you actually know who you're trying to reach, right? Yes. Do you actually even know the title that that person holds? Uh, generally, yeah. yeah. Imagine a world where you'll be able to put out a piece of content to everybody in any area, the whole country, just Alabama, just Tennessee, just Southeast, where you'll be able to put out a piece of content that they'll all see in their LinkedIn stream based on the title they hold. So that's what's gonna happen for sales for a couple of years before they get tired of that shit. <laughs> that's right, but that's gonna really work. You got it. The other thing is for B2B people here, my number one thing is to try to put the B2B magazine out of business that's in your business. If you start putting out content that would have showed up on the B2B magazine side and you're putting it out as you, as you as a person or as you as an organization, the battle, and it was the last answer for the lovely lady with the high school thing, the number one thing that all of you need to understand that I didn't harp on, that there's an entire chapter in this book, even though it has nothing to do with the thesis of the book, but I so believe it's gonna happen, I wanted to get historical credit for it, is, that's really why it's in the book, um, is every single person in here and every single person's company in here will be a media company. You will be a media company. And so what that means is if you're in B2B and you're in sales, Whoever you're trying to reach, whatever they're reading to get educated on their business, you're gonna actually be putting out those white papers and slide shares and infographics as a gateway drug to awareness. Absolutely, the best way to sell is to teach. It's, and the reason, the reason that works a lot, the best way to sell is to listen, to teach, it's to provide upfront value. The person that gives value first has the leverage. <laughs> All right, yeah. My name is Ernest Dempsey. I'm a fiction author and a blogger. Awesome, hey, Ernest. And um, I had a question about, you were talking about how email is fading. Yeah, open, open rates on email in 1996 for people that sent email lists was in the 60, 70, and 80 percentile. Open rates today are in the 20, 22, so behavior has shifted. Right, my, my, my open rates are only like 30 to 40 percent. That's pretty good. And you're probably niche, it's probably not, you, you don't have 400,000 people on your email list. Right, mm -hmm. so my next question. And by the way, how many people do you have if you don't mind sharing? No, it's fine, I have 500. 
Right, so let me give you the open rates of people that had 500 people on their email list in 1999, 96%. You know, because back to like, we used to, and you might have noticed the body language, I've noticed it over here more, like we just read every email. That's why we they have back that, and so, go ahead. Well, so with, with that in mind, and with social media being so crowded, yep. what do you feel like, and this is one of those Nostradamus questions, yep. sorry for showing the spot with No worries. No, nobody's letting you into their text. Right, exactly. Who here wants to get texts from brands and businesses? I kill somebody if they text me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I kill a man. <laughs> list building stays forever. Facebook and Twitter are list building. Vine is list building. The theory of building an audience and then marketing to them stays forever. If when when or if you read this book. You'll see up front, I sell the thesis of no matter what it goes to, no matter where it goes, why my email list is up 10% open rates in the last 12 months. You know why? We made it more editorial and we're teaching people about wine instead of every email being buy this Pinot Noir. So the future of list building is we're going to learn a lot about this last decade and we're all going to provide more value. Got it? You know what your next email should be? I'm gonna give you a really good idea. And I, I really hope you take advantage of this and I hope you email me and tell me I'm great. <laughs> your next email should be titled, what can I do for you? I guarantee you'll get more open rate. I guarantee you'll get more response. And you'll also get insight to your audience, what they're looking for from you. Can I ask you one last question? You sure can. You're welcome. How'd you like the I loved the jet strap. <laughs> yeah, the prior's a great pick. I, I'm usually, the, like, they, they could all stink and get hurt and it might not work out, but this is probably my favorite draft since the 2000 draft. The kid from Oklahoma I'm really excited about, Saunders. I'm, I'm really into this team. This draft was really strong. Thanks, brother. I'm very aware of what you guys have. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm Mike. Hey, Mike. Sean Ellis went to Tennessee, right? Yeah. Love him. 2000 draft. All right, go ahead, sorry. We'll see. I'm just kidding. Go ahead, brother. So, uh, what do you see as kind of the future of, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, you got to get content here and content here and content here, but as you say, we don't care about advertising content. We skip through things. So, where do you I think it's happening now with native ads. If you look at BuzzFeed and Upworthy and things of that nature, we're already on our way there. Yes, to your answer. And like, I, yeah, I do think, I think the days of disruptive ads. I wanna watch Happy Days, but the Fonz just left and now I'm looking at a Ford commercial are over. Or the process of a diminishing value is well underway. And so the reason if you look, how many people here are familiar with BuzzFeed? Raise your hands. So as a lot of you know, no banner ads on BuzzFeed. What happens is every 10th, 15th post is brought to you by a sponsor. And they haven't cracked it yet either because like Verizon's doing a 13 kittens that smell like crap, right? Like it doesn't make sense, but it will get there eventually. And, um, and so native, my, my Vine agency, we're getting paid, it's all product placement, right? Like, and the Viners have full creative control. So they're not plugging, they're like doing smart stuff that they know their audience will, at least some, maybe they don't want them to fully sell out, but if it's still funny or interesting, it's still got something, right? So I think, I think the days of ads that bring no value to the customer and is completely in the self-interest of the brand to push down your throat are diminishing and we're gonna have to adjust to it. How much time do I have? Zero? All right, I'm gonna sneak one in, all the way to the top. Hi, my name is Monica, and I, I'm an owner and operator of a music venue, and I'm just curious, my demographic changes with the shows that I have. Yeah. I'm just wondering, is it are the social media platforms niche-driven, or do you think all businesses should be on all social media platforms? I think they're niche-driven, but there's certain that are scale. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are enough scale that everybody's there, so you have to think about that. Number two, 
I don't know how much money, if any, you spend on ads, but if you do, you need to understand this, and everybody here should go back home and Google this term and understand what I'm about to say. The single best advertising digital product that I have seen since buying the keyword wine on Google in the year 2000 for 10 cents and nobody rebidding me up for nine months <laughs> is Facebook dark posts. So what a Facebook dark post is, is the days of actually having to build a fan page are actually over. You don't need to drive people to like you anymore, if you're willing to pay for ads. Um, the ability for you to make a piece of content, a flyer, mm -hmm. right? Then you, old school mechanics. Still do it. That's right. <laughs> so making a digital flyer and posting it to people that live in Chattanooga that are 18 to 19, that like Bill Cosby, and drink jello and like rain. Like the targeting is so absurd right. that it's insane and you will crush it if you know what you're doing. Okay. Because you're literally reaching the exact people you're supposed to. And even though it's reaching 137 people, when 42 of them convert, you won. Got it? Right. Thank Guys, I gotta go.